see if you can guess the vocation. The, the job description may go something like this. A blank, also known as an enologist, enologist or vintner, oversees the entire production process of making blank, including harvesting, crushing, fermentation, aging, blending, and bottling. They combine scientific concepts with practical experience to alter a blank's chemical composition and make key decisions based on levels of acid, sugar, sulfur, and sulfites. Who is being described there? A winemaker, right? A winemaker. Uh, if you're from like the Napa Valley, you probably got that right away. But uh, most of us probably picked up on some of those key words that were there. A winemaker. Now, winemaker is not one that I remember when I went to college that they had a course of study <laughs> to get a degree in winemaking. I don't, I've never met anybody who's a winemaker. Uh, I'm guessing there are some hobbyists and others who like to do some of that stuff in, on their, in their spare time, like the people who like to make their own beer. Uh, I'm just not sure. What I do know is that this morning, God wants us to consider the most incredible winemaker in all of human history and how that winemaker can radically change your life. Turn, if you have not done so already, turn, if you would, to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Turn there, navigate over there, scroll down to John, chapter 2. As I mentioned, we are resuming our study of John's Gospel exactly where we left off. In January, we were able to view some amazing vistas, weren't we? <laughs> we talk about scenic overlook we pulled off so many times to take a look at what God was revealing in chapter 1 to us about Jesus, and it was astounding. It was awesome. So we're excited to keep pressing forward in the Gospel of John, picking up now in chapter 2. I'd like to look at verses 1 through 12 this morning, but if we begin by focusing on verses just 1 through 10... I suggest that we break down the passage like this. Take a look at the screen, if you would. We read, in terms of a breakdown, we read in verses 1 through 5 about an unexpected hitch. Then in verses 6 through 8 about unspectacular miracle working. And finally, in verses 9 and 10, we read about unbiased confirmation. An unexpected hitch, unspectacular miracle working, and unbiased confirmation. Let's take a look together at each of those sections. Follow along in your Bible as I read verses 1 through 5. First, we read about that unexpected hitch. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with me? That's not a gruff response. You can use that word woman in, a, in actually an affectionate way in the Aramaic language. So don't, <laughs> Jesus is not just being short-tempered with his mom. No, not at all. Uh, woman or dear woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour, said Jesus, has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Sounds like a good Jewish mother, right? <laughs> I don't know what you just said, but listen, you do whatever he tells you to do. So let's stop there. Cana was about eight miles away from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Jesus, Nazareth is only mentioned in the Gospel of John as a qualifier in terms of identifying Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, eight miles to the north, northeast of Nazareth, lay the town of Cana. If you recall, what's interesting, in fact, about Cana is that if we fast forward to the very end of this gospel, in chapter 21, verse 2, we read that Nathanael 
is actually from Cana of Galilee. That's his hometown. And who was the very last disciple mentioned to us in John chapter 1? Nathaniel. Nathaniel, who is probably referred to in the other Gospels, as we talked about, as Bartholomew. Since Bartholomew simply means the son of Ptolemy. So Nathaniel, the son of Ptolemy, was from Cana. Now, whether it was Nathaniel or it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, who had some connection to the bride or the groom or both, it's not clear. It's, we're not told exactly how they ended up at this wedding. However, however it came together, however it happened, uh, what is clear here is that an invitation was extended not only to Jesus, but also to those who followed him, who were following him as disciples. It may have been by this point as they arrived from Judea into Galilee that uh, word had already begun to spread about Jesus. He had now this following of men. And it may have been, uh, it may have been that the couple who was getting married, the families thought it would be an honor to have them attend the wedding. As we see in verse 1, speaking of this wedding, we see that this wedding is, has taken place, is taking place on the third day. Is that a symbolic reference? Maybe to Easter, to the resurrection? Well, I'm not sure about that. Nothing gives us an indication of that in the text. I think if we simply take it at face value, in the context, context it means that on the third day after Jesus set out for Galilee, that's John chapter 1, verse 43, Jesus determined that he would go back to Galilee. Uh, that's not just a, a single day trip. It takes a little bit to get from Judea walking all the way back up to Galilee. So it's on the third day after they set out that they arrive and they attend this wedding in Cana. So what exactly happened on that third day? Well, the wedding. Why is it important? Why do we, the reader, need to know about this wedding? Well, it all starts here. We know that the getting hitched part of the day, thankfully, went off without a hitch, <laughs> right? <laughs> it went off without a hitch, the getting hitched part, but unfortunately, the reception did not. It did not. This joyful gathering, friends and family, neighbors, honored guests, all of those, all of a sudden, it had run out of wine. Now, Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably hears about this before anybody else does, however that worked out. And she is concerned, as rightly so, about who the families involved, that they would not be humiliated in the middle of this great feast that they've thrown for this amazing occasion of a wedding. So what does she do wanting to help this family? She turns to Jesus. Now, it's not clear from the text what she expected Jesus to do. But if his response to her is any indication, then it may be that she expected something miraculous. Look at his response to her. He connects her requests to help with this wedding. He connects it with what? Look at that. He connects it with his hour, his time. You see that? He says, my hour has not yet come. Now, that is a phrase that we find in subsequent chapters of the Gospel of John. For example, he similarly tells his half-brothers in chapter 7, verse 6, my time has not yet come. Later in that same chapter, we read that the Jewish leaders could not arrest Jesus. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. Chapter 7, verse 30. The same is said about uh, uh, their inability to catch him, to capture him, in chapter 8, verse 20. But when we arrive at chapter 12, verse 23, we hear this declaration from Jesus, this triumphant declaration. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
That's right after what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we know based on the context, that is from chapter 12, right after that declaration onward, that what Jesus is talking about and why they were unable to catch him, capture him, corner him before that because his hour had not yet come, we know from all of this context that Jesus' hour is the fulfillment of God's sovereign purposes in his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, and his exaltation to the right hand of the Father. That will only happen according to God's timetable. But now all the events have been providentially set into motion in chapter 12. I think the connection here, because we look back to our main passage this morning, and we have to ask, what does any of that have to do with a request for wine at a wedding in Cana? Remember, this is years before the death of Jesus, at least three years before the death of Jesus. So what does any of that have to do? Why is Jesus, when his mom says, help out, why is he bringing up this, this idea of his hour? I think the connection here is the public setting. The public setting of a wedding. And what seems to be a request by Mary for some kind of public and possibly miraculous intervention by Jesus. So, so even though Jesus does intervene in an amazing way, as we'll go on to see, he first makes it clear that the lack of wine at a local wedding reception is not really one of his messianic priorities, <laughs> right? It's, it's not one of, it's not like right there on the top of the list in terms of what he came to do. And he wants to make it clear that he's not interested in a showy or attention-getting intervention. And that brings us to this next point. It brings us to verses 6 through 8, and it, it, we read in the following account, in those verses, what could be described as an unspectacular, as, could be described as unspectacular miracle working by Jesus. What do I mean by that? Well, look at, with me at verses 6 through 8. John writes, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. Their hands were washed there. Uh, their dishes were washed there in these kinds of jars. The water that was, was kept in the house for that reason. So each of these jars held 20 or 30 gallons of water. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some of it out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Now, did you see it there? Did you see it? Did you hear how John described this miracle of Jesus? This is Jesus, the man that Nathaniel, Nathaniel of Cana, this is the man that he had confessed only verses earlier as the Son of God. Chapter 1, verse 49. So John describes this, this spectacular here, this spectacular event, in a decidedly unspectacular way. Why is that? Because what Jesus did was unspectacular on the surface. There's nothing glitzy or glamorous here, right? If this was a big Hollywood production then you would have Jesus like walking over to these water jars and, you know, putting his hands on them and his eyes would like start throbbing or whatever. He'd be like, oh, or you put his hands over or something like that and there'd be a bright light coming out of the, each and every jar. Or whatever. No, none of that is happening. Nothing like that's happening. Fill those up with water. Good. Take some of that out. Give it to the master of the feast. That's it. He simply has these servants fill up the large stone jars of water, take the contents to the master of ceremonies, the guy who's emceeing the whole, the whole reception. Now, what exactly then, if we didn't know this story before, what exactly then was so spectacular about what Jesus did here? 
Well, look with me at verses 9 and 10. We read that when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine. Now become wine. Water that had now become wine. And this man did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew This guy, this master of the feast, called the bridegroom. That's the groom. And he said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, maybe a little tipsy, you know, a little bit of a buzz, whatever it might be, then you get out the poor wine. Then the inferior wine comes out. But you, and you can hear the astonishment, even though it's not mentioned explicitly, you can sense from the context that he's saying, but you have kept the good wine until now. Until right now at the end. So this spectacular miracle described by John, almost in passing in verse 9, right? He doesn't even really focus on it. He just basically says, and so they took this water that had now become wine. You know, it now become wine. And, and you know, the reader's like thinking, Wait, what did he just say? The water had now become wine? Wow. And look at how this master of ceremonies, without even knowing it, confirms for us that a true transformation had taken place. There's no trickery here. Jesus had not slipped a little wine into these things of water to produce some kind of nasty, watered-down imitation beverage for the, for the festivities. No. What Jesus created was acknowledged by the master of the feast to be the good wine. This is the good stuff. The best of your supply. The one, the stuff that you would normally put out at the beginning. Right away. To make that impression. He was saying, where has this been the whole time? Why are you just bringing it out now? Again, notice that John makes sure that his readers, including us, He makes sure that we understand this man did not know where the wine came from. He had no idea. But the writer also emphasizes that the servants who filled the jars, they recognized what had happened. We aren't told about their reactions. We don't know anything about their response to what had taken place. But those servants, they knew about Mary's request. They knew about Jesus' instructions to them. And they knew that it was water that they had put into those jars. So Jesus has intervened in a miraculous way, but he's done so behind the scenes. He's done so that even the master of the feast has no idea. That it's not going to be shouted from the rooftops that something miraculous has happened. Only he, his mother, his disciples, and these servants, a handful of servants, know what took place. So what are we to make of this story? What are we to make of this story? What would John want us to take away from this account? What would God want us to take away this morning? Well, notice the two final verses of our passage. Verses 11 and 12. Now, verse 12, take a look at it. It's simply a transitional verse emphasizing the fact that Jesus stayed in Galilee but he stayed down in the city of Capernaum. These readers were most likely familiar with the many stories that uh, had, were, later, were to, later to be found in the Synoptic Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They either knew of these Gospels in their earliest form, or they had heard the stories that would be collected in these books. So they knew from those that Capernaum was kind of the headquarters of Jesus. That was where he operated from when he was in Galilee. So John simply wants to affirm that. Uh, Verse 12, After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Of course, we read about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke about even how his mother Remember, his mothers and brothers came to him while he was teaching in Capernaum. Uh, So we know that they were there on many occasions. 
staying with him or visiting from Nazareth. But, all that being said, the most important verse in this whole passage is verse 11. Look at verse 11. It's the verse I haven't read yet. Verse 11. This, writes John, this, turning water to wine, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. And he manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Let me read that again. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. As we've talked about in the very first message in this series, this book that we call and generations have called the Gospel of John could easily also be entitled The Seven Signs of Jesus. Because that's what John lays out for us. The seven signs of Jesus. As we just heard in verse 11, this miracle in Cana was the first of his miracles. The first of his signs. Notice what the sign accomplished. Yes, practically, we understand. It kept the wedding feast on track with no, you know, with no public humiliation or shame of those who were putting on the festivities. We know that people's tongues were wetted, right? <laughs> uh, they were satisfied uh, with what had, what had happened. That's a practical effect, an accomplishment here. But notice what this sign accomplished more meaningful, meaningfully. Even more important than filling stomachs, according to verse 11, this miracle revealed glory. This miracle revealed glory. Whose glory? His glory is what we see. His glory. The glory of Jesus. And as a result, look at the final phrase in verse 11. And his disciples believed in him. Now wait a minute. I thought his disciples already believed in him. Why did they follow him if they didn't believe in him? What about the confessions in chapter 1? We have found the Messiah. Guess what? We found the one that Moses and the prophets spoke about. Guess what? You, this is the Son of God, the King of Israel. John the Baptist's confession, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. One is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. All those confessions. Didn't they believe in him? Already, I think what John is emphasizing here, and this is important for all who are here, all who are listening, who believe, who indeed do believe this morning, I think John is emphasizing for us here that the understanding and the faith of these disciples was deepened in this moment. It was deepened. The understanding was expanded. The faith was deepened in light of what they beheld. Because of what they saw, because of what they understood, and they recognized through this first sign that Jesus was indeed God's agent of creation. Jesus was God's agent of creation creation. Now remember, one of the disciples mentioned in verse 11, those disciples who, who saw his glory, right, and they believed in him. One of those disciples was the one who's writing these words for us, in all likelihood John, the author of this gospel. Do you remember what John told us in chapter 1, verse 3? Look back there, flip the page over, scroll back to chapter 1, verse 3. This is what John, who beheld his glory in Cana, who beheld that miracle, who witnessed it with, it with his own eyes, and I would dare say he not only witnessed it with his own eyes, he tasted it with his own tongue, his own mouth. Right? They saw that water, and he said, take it, and all the disciples scratched their head like, 
Why was he telling him to take water over to the master of the ceremonies? And then all of a sudden, the master of the feast says, this is the greatest wine. And these guys are thinking to themselves, what, is, what has just happened? And you know they rushed over there. <laughs> and they put a little cup in or something, and they drank of it. And they were astonished. So that John writes in chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made in all of creation that was made. All creation was made through him. Who is John talking about? The Word, verse 1 of chapter 1. He's talking about the Word. He was the agent of God's creation, and all things were made through Him. But also remember what we learned in verse 14. Scroll down to verse 14 of chapter 1. Look down to it. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. We have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That, brothers and sisters, that, friends, was the same glory that Jesus manifested at the wedding in Cana. And he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. God the Son the Word, through whom the water and sun were made, through whom the seed and the soil were made, through whom the vine and the grape were made, through whom the process of fermentation came, this same one, now dwelling in flesh, displayed that same creation glory by, in this case, Instantly transforming the water into wine. What he had created as a process through all the elements that came at his behest. The agent of creation now, without even a word, like presto or boom, now it's wine or whatever. He just says simply, he willed it and the water became wine. Jesus is not only the Word, the God who called, God the Son who called into being what wasn't. He is also the wine maker, the God who still transforms what is. Today. Today. Do you know Him in this way? Do you know him in this way? Do you trust him as such? Jesus the winemaker. What does that mean exactly? Take a look at this screen. To trust in Jesus the winemaker is to trust that the incarnate word still accomplishes miraculous transformations in our times of need. To trust in Jesus the winemaker is to trust that the incarnate word still accomplishes miraculous transformations in our times of need. This is who and this is what the passage is revealing. It all comes down to verse 11. Why does John even include this story? Well, notably... It's the first sign of Jesus, but that's not even enough. It's the first sign of Jesus, and it revealed His glory. It revealed His glory. Has this glory been manifested to you? Has it been manifested to you this morning as you heard these words? Shake off your familiarity with this passage and hear afresh this account. Jesus turned water into wine. He simply willed it, and it was so. Sometimes we are afraid of change. Some of us despise change. We don't like it. We don't want it. Even when there's the possibility that things could be get better, we stick with what we know. But at other times... All we seek is change. <laughs> a 
change of scenery, a change of luck, a change of careers, a change of circumstances, a change of partners. However you feel about change this morning, God is calling you to trust Him. Not for change, but even better, for transformation. For transformation. Change is about swapping or replacing. Transformation is about becoming. Becoming. Remember, the Word was the Father's agent of creation. And so I ask you this morning, believer, what is He creating or recreating in your life today? What is He creating or recreating? In what ways do you long? Are you longing this morning for His transformative power in your life? Please hear me. The one who turned the water into wine can also turn your fears to faith, your pain to purpose, your disappointments to dependence, your roadblocks to rest, your trials to testimony, your want to witness, your barrenness to bounty, your lack to to opportunity, your weakness to strength, your mistakes to milestone moments, your earthly illness to eternal impact, your burned bridges to healing and wholeness, your ordinary life to an extraordinary channel for His power. Do you remember the Apostles' goal for this book? Do you remember what we talked about? John wants to feed our faith with a sound and profound view, vision of Jesus. John wants to feed your faith with a sound and profound vision of Jesus. He's been doing that, hasn't he? He did that in chapter 1. He's done that remarkably here for us in chapter 2. Has he done that for you this morning? Has he fed your faith? Is your understanding expanding? Is your faith deepening because of what you're learning about Jesus Christ this morning? All of us need Jesus the winemaker, don't we? The God who not only created once in the past, but the God who transforms what is today. A God of transformation. Not simply change, a God of transformation. Will you trust him today as God's agent of both creation and recreation? What will you bring to him? Friend, sister, brother, what will you bring to him today and ask him to transform in your life? Mary understood the need and came with a request to Jesus. Do you understand your need? Maybe it's pressing in on you, hot and heavy, right today. It's there at the forefront of your mind, something you have not been able to shake even as I've been talking to you this entire time because it's dominating. It's got a grip, a vice grip on your heart and your mind, and you're struggling. Will you bring that to Jesus, the winemaker, this morning? Will you bring that to him in light of who he has revealed himself to be just as he revealed himself at Cana in Galilee? Listen to this. Because his hour did come. Because his hour did come because of the cross, because of his resurrection also on the third day, Praise God. Because of that, the greatest of all transformations can take place. Think about it. The all too common water of a hardened heart by His power can be transformed into the eternal wine of a soft heart. 
a soul remade, a redeemed guest who will one day attend not the wedding described by John in Cana, but the wedding described by John in Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. And the angel said to me, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I would love to have been there if I had a time machine and to go back to Cana. I would love to be a guest at that wedding. But oh, we don't even understand what we're in store for. For those who know Jesus, for those who follow Jesus, for those who have been born from above because of Jesus, we will be guests at this wedding, at this reception, at this feast, and the wine that the winemaker, Jesus Christ, will give us is already ours because He transforms hearts of stone and makes them into hearts of flesh. He pours out His Holy Spirit, the good wine of the Spirit, into our lives. Power of transformation. The Spirit of God who hovered over the waters at the very beginning of all things is the Spirit who dwells in you because of Christ. The Spirit who is remaking you at work to transform you. What will you bring? Are you looking forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Which Lamb is this? John chapter 1 verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the Lamb. That is the Lamb who redeems us and transforms us because of His glory for the Father's glory that we might enjoy glory forever. Amen? That we might behold Him in His glory forever. What will you bring to Jesus, the winemaker, today? Let's look to Him this morning with eyes of faith that have been wonderfully informed by His Word. Pray with me now if you would.